Well, this may be a bit of an awkward thing to do in uh, an online message, but I've been feeling it for some time and I haven't been uh, teaching it over a month, so I'm just gonna kind of say it. I miss you. I miss you, I really do. I know that Facebook will kind of set themselves up as the modern day equivalent to chairs and that there's something that we can experience online. And I hope that that's true, uh, even environments like this digitally. But I gotta say, I miss being together. I miss uh, hearing what's going on in your world. I miss seeing all of you. Obviously that's extra awkward if you're catching this for the first time. I don't really miss you because I've never met you, but uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you as well. And uh, for those of us who call Southridge our home, I, I, I miss being together as a family. I don't know when we're gonna be able to kind of open up and what that timeline or process will look like, but uh, I miss being together and uh, just wanted to say that today, especially because now that we're a couple months into this, coronavirus pandemic, uh, I'm getting the sense that all of us are trying to navigate this aloneness uh, in different ways. I know that those of us who are more introverted, we're just exhausted with all the Zoom meetings. And on the contrary, those of us who are extroverted, we're craving human connection like a Canadian craves sunlight in the winter. And I don't know where you find yourself, but I know that all of us in this uh, season of isolation and of physical distancing, we're all trying to navigate the, the disproportionate aloneness that we have to deal with. And so uh, as part of this Working Out Our Faith series, what we wanted to do was to try to capture some of the opportunity of this season by discovering the power of a spiritual practice known as the practice of solitude. So that's what we're going to look at today is the spiritual practice of solitude. Before we do that, though, uh, let's just have a brief review about why we're even doing this series. Uh, we believe that this series is going to give us the opportunity in the middle of this pandemic to come out of it on the other side in the very best spiritual shape than we've ever found ourselves in by discovering a practice-based faith. And the basis of practice-based faith is basically three core ideas. Number one, that only Jesus can live his life through us, that the Christian life isn't something we try to do, it's something that we allow Jesus to do in and through our lives, which means our responsibility as Jesus followers is to, as he describes, abide in him. We learned that in the first week of this series that, you know, Jesus images himself as the grapevine and we're the branches. We're, we're to maintain a close, constant, personal connection with him. And so to do that, to live in that abiding presence requires, as Brother Lawrence has described, practicing the presence of God. We practice the presence of God to live in an abiding relationship with Jesus so he can live his life through us. That's the basis for a practice-based faith and why we're spending week after week after week digging into different spiritual practices that we can experiment with and experience God's activity in our lives to a greater degree. So I know that last week we looked at a very similar spiritual practice uh, as Kerry Jones led us in the spiritual practice of silence. Understand that silence is very different than solitude. They're, they're both spaces to be alone with God, but silence is much more uh, kind of passive and, and being still to know that God is God and even trying to center ourselves around listening to what God has for us. Solitude is a bit more of an active engagement when you're alone with God to actually deliberately stare at the bigger questions of life. It's more of a spiritual reflection exercise, whereby being deliberate to create space for God, we also be deliberate to stare at the bigger questions of life. And in those escapes from the everyday, they can help define and drive and fuel the moments of our everyday. That's how solitude works. Before we get into discovering how to experience that or practice that in our own lives, let's first off appreciate that this was a spiritual practice that Jesus engaged in himself, especially in those key preparatory moments in his life and ministry. For example, in Luke chapter 4, it describes that just before Jesus launched his public teaching ministry, he engaged in an extended period of solitude. It says in Luke 4 verses 1 and 2, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. 
Jesus actually prepared himself by spending 40 days in solitude and didn't just stare at the big questions of life. He actually allowed the devil, the spiritual enemy of God, to kind of tempt him and challenge him with the most pressing questions. And by facing those questions head on, in an, in an isolated way, that escape from his everyday prepared him for his public teaching ministry. We also see this shortly before Jesus gave his life up for the sin of you and me. Uh, later on in Luke chapter 9, it says Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And if you read uh, further on in Luke chapter 9, uh, this is where Jesus is supernaturally transfigured. And some prophets of old actually reappear to Jesus and give him kind of a pep talk of sorts to kind of reaffirm his calling and his destiny to give his life up as a sacrifice for human sin. Again, that escape from the everyday provided Jesus an anchoring and a grounding and a direction that kind of defined the next era of his everyday. That's what the spiritual practice of solitude can do. Now, in our context at Southridge, in our leadership environment at least, we have a name for the carving out of those kind of spaces. We call them retreats. And uh, this is actually uh, getting to be a bit of a disappointing season because uh, in June, typically, uh, our leadership, in a whole bunch of different ways, experiences retreat season where our leadership team or our board of elders or even our whole staff get away and gather together in uh, kind of an uninterrupted space to experience the wonder of a retreat. Most of you who've never been on one might think it's kind of a precursor to vacation season, but for those of us who've experienced one of those retreat seasons, we know that it is a very sacred and significant spiritual time because of the uninterrupted space that we create to be together alone with God. At a personal level, that's what solitude is on the one hand. It's creating retreat kind of spaces to be alone with God. On the other hand, it's creating significant conversation with God when you kind of face those major questions of life. And, you know, to think about that, I, I think about some of the, the serious or significant conversations that relationships have, friendships have, or teams have, or especially couples have. We call them relationship-defining talks. I've kind of joked that over the years, every time Becky and I have a wedding anniversary, whether we're walking down a beach or we're across each other in a, in a restaurant, at a restaurant table, we'll have a little meeting, kind of a relationship-defining talk. We call it our annual general meeting, where we'll discuss the year that was and the year ahead and kind of debrief and look forward and have the kind of conversation that we wouldn't normally have uh, in a kind of a day-to-day -day basis. And you'll be happy to know that just this past week, uh, on Tuesday actually, Becky and I celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. And so, uh, like we do every year, we created some space where we could get away from the kids and just in an uninterrupted way, have a, you know, sort of one of these kinds of meetings, only this time, not in an annual way, but in like a two decade kind of way, staring at the last two decades and looking ahead at the next two decades and asking, you know, where God wants us to go and what we need from each other. And uh, I get joked about this, that, you know, only someone with my wiring could get turned on by a meeting. But I'll tell you, these kinds of conversations and the significance significance of them in the escape from our everyday have helped in our relationship to define and to drive and to fuel our relationship in our everyday. And that's the power of the practice of solitude, not only creating the retreat kind of space, but also having those relationship defining talks, having those, those conversations where you stare at the big issues of life together. So appreciate that there's a lot of deliberacy that goes into the spiritual practice of solitude. Solitude isn't just being alone. There's a big difference, actually, between the, the spiritual practice of solitude and aloneness, or especially loneliness. I've heard someone describe loneliness as inner emptiness, but describe solitude through its deliberacy as inner fulfillment. And we need to to appreciate the deliberate steps that differentiate being alone or even being lonely from experiencing the power of God's activity in our lives through the spiritual practice of solitude. At a practical level, there are two specific deliberate steps that we've got to got to take. We've got to take the step of creating the retreat space 
creating the uninterrupted space to be alone with God, and then staring at those big questions of life face to face together with God. It's creating the space and then clarifying the big questions that we feel God wants to ask us in this era of our lives. So for starters, let's consider the creating of the space and consider what kind of retreat spaces each of us can create in our lives, even on a day like today. Uh, when we're thinking about retreats, we don't just have to go away somewhere or be away for extended days overnight. I actually heard one pastor describe uh, the, the, the practice of solitude as diverting daily, withdrawing weekly, and abandoning annually. And so if we think through that framework, ask ourselves, how can we divert daily in just, you know, 15 or 30 minutes every day of our lives and experience the power of solitude? What space in our calendar, what space in our home or in our apartment, what chair, what front porch, what backyard can we go to to experience uninterrupted space with God? On a weekly basis, what extended space can we create where we can go for a walk or a hike or a bike ride for, you know, maybe a couple hours and stare at those big questions of life? And on an annual basis, what extended periods of time and what spaces can we create to be alone with God and reflect in a way that we otherwise normally wouldn't? Right? What kind of re retreat spaces can we create in order to create the space for God to experience the power of solitude? And then on the other hand, let's consider what kinds of conversations we can actually focus on when we've created that space. One practical, helpful tip when we're experimenting with the practice of solitude is to bring a notepad or a journal and something to write on so that we can specifically kind of inventory the questions that we feel God most wants us to stare at in this moment of solitude and kind of reflect on what our answers might be to those questions. Especially time after time after time, that journal can become kind of a logbook or a mile marker to the benchmarks of the way God was speaking to us and how God has been faithful in growing us over those periods of time. But at a very practical level, we can consider, you know, the kind of questions God might want us to face in a variety of different structures. I've heard some people approach uh, this in the same way that companies often do through what's called a SWOT analysis. SWOT meaning S-W-O-T. It stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we can actually kind of organize our page in those quadrants and kind of inventory what those look like for our lives and pay attention to the kind of things that jump out from the page that God might want us to have specific attention towards. Or a more simpler uh, kind of framework is one that we often do in our marriage, and I know that our Board of Elders does, in kind of a looking back, looking ahead, kind of a two-part. You can kind of draw a line down your page and look back and look ahead and make some notes and think about what some of the big issues are that you want to stare at today in your time of solitude. Uh, I've heard families often will kind of have a little bit, bit of a debrief every day of their highest highs and lowest lows. Helps us to kind of optimize the good and learn from and try to avoid uh, the challenges in our lives. It really doesn't matter how structured you are so long as you're deliberate in kind of identifying some key questions. Another really helpful uh, strategy that I've seen people employ that's helped from time to time for me as well is the use of scripture during those times. To take a passage like Jesus' teaching on the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, or the list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, or the Apostle Paul's list of what love looks like in 1 Corinthians 13, and just stare at that in your time of solitude and ask God what attributes he'd like you to most focus on in this next era of your life. I find what that helps do is avoid any blind spots because as simple as this might seem, this is not always easy to do. I've actually heard of people who've been encouraged to go on personal retreat days and kind of experiment with the practice of solitude, and they've had to bail after 10 or 15 minutes because as soon as they get alone with God and start staring at those deeper questions of life, they realize that they've been avoiding them and they've been neglecting them and actually pretending or hiding or acting like they didn't exist, and as they face them, they're just overwhelmed. So realize that this is not easy to do, but in the deliberacy of creating retreat space and in the deliberacy of staring at some big questions of life, God can show up in anchoring and encouraging and in trajectory-defining ways where those escapes from our everyday 
can help fuel the next era of our everyday moving ahead. In an environment like this, I know it might be too awkward to kind of experiment with solitude right here and right now, so I, I wonder if one of the preliminary steps might be to consider what kinds of questions you might want to consider if you were to carve out a retreat space of solitude with God. Sometimes just thinking about what we might want to reflect on in a time of solitude can provide us the motivation to do so because we realize that by paying attention to our interior world, there are some valuable things that we could kind of address and improve on. And if we gave God the space to work on that in our lives, our lives could get even better. And so maybe considering that gives you the motivation to know that you need some alone time. In my life, there are times where I just can sense that I need some alone time. And one of those times happened for me very early on in this COVID pandemic. I mentioned to many of you that uh, this whole thing kind of blew up just before March break while my family was actually in Guatemala. We were at a compassion sponsor visit for our compassion sponsor daughter. And from Guatemala, we flew directly to Mexico uh, in hopes of spending March break there. But uh, a couple days into the March break, when things really started to get intense, I know that uh, borders started to close and businesses started to be deemed as non-essential and things started to get really serious. And I could just feel in my spirit that I needed some alone time. Uh, it was after lunch and Becky was gearing up to kind of take the kids out. And I told her to just go alone without me. And I was going to spend the afternoon alone because I could just feel I, I, I hadn't slept that well the night before. And I, I, I could just feel that I needed some alone time with God. And so for that that, that afternoon, it was about three hours, uh, I spent some time uh, reading the Bible, spent some time in extended prayer, tried to spend some time in listening prayer to kind of hear what God might have to say to me, all of the spiritual practices that we've discussed in this series so far. But most specifically, I made a little list of some of the big questions that I felt I needed to focus on in this next era as we entered into this pandemic. Questions like, you know, of all the things that I didn't know, what did I know for sure, for sure? Of all the things that were changing, what could I count on that wouldn't change? Um, personal questions like, what did God want from me in this next era? What did other people need from me as a, as a husband, a dad, as, as a leader? Uh, what kind of person did I want to be? What story did I want God to tell through my life and our family and through our church in this next era? You know, one of the considerations was of the church that, you know, as the only invincible, indestructible entity in human history, how would the church prevail in a time like this? What would it take for the church to rise and shine like never before? And I'll tell you, those kinds of questions, while I certainly haven't handled this perfectly, and while I definitely haven't had it as hard as some of you, some of you have been battling this every day on the front lines, and you have my highest respect and daily prayer for doing so. Uh, I gotta say, those three hours were so influential in the calmness and the comfort and the anchoring and actually the focus of the way my life has been defined in the last couple months. Those three hours of escape from my every day have been a tremendous fuel. Not that it's been the only time I've tried to spend with God, but those three extended hours of kind of personal retreat have been so significant in the way that they've defined my every day in the last number of months through this pandemic. And so this morning, we just wish that you would be able to experience the power of that kind of spiritual practice as well. And in this season of isolation and disproportionate physical distancing and aloneness, you could actually take advantage of a spiritual practice like this through the discipline and deliberacy, deliberacy of creating retreat spaces, and then in those isolated, uninterrupted spaces, kind of facing and staring deliberately at some of the big questions of life. We hope that you can, you can deliberately try to leverage the power of solitude in your life and in those escapes from your everyday, experience the activity of God to drive and fuel your everyday in a way that you otherwise never, never had before. So that in this season, through the experience of a whole bunch of spiritual practices, but particularly the practice of solitude, you can experience God's presence like never before and come out of this in the very best spiritual shape of your life. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you for your faithfulness to continue to walk with us personally and as a church family in the season that we find ourselves in. And I pray that 
especially in this season of disproportionate aloneness, we would learn how to capitalize on that. And in practices like silence, and particularly today in practices like solitude, we would be able to make the most out of the opportunities that we have to be alone with you. I pray that we would create deliberate retreat spaces, and I pray that in those retreat spaces, we would face some of those relational defining talks and conversations that you want to have with us, so that in those escapes from our everyday, you can drive and define and fuel our everyday like never before. God, we look forward to watching you work in that way, and I pray that we would even give some consideration now to the kind of questions you would want us to face were we to create that space in our lives. We know that we're going to find you faithful. I pray that we give you the honor and the praise when we do, and we thank you for helping us to get into the very best spiritual shape in our lives as we experience your presence and activity among us like never before. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.